Hello. Welcome to Syntax Slots, or Capitalising on the Syntagmatic and Paradigmatic Structure of Language. Well, doesn't that sound all very highfalutin? Actually, in this short presentation, you'll get to see an interesting activity requiring some playfulness with language that I've called Syntax Slots. This activity does indeed capitalise on a particular feature of our language system and in a way you may think of it as a form of scaffolding and it can be adapted by teachers to help students become more comfortable with language structures typically found in literary or academic texts. But first, what is it based on? Well, it is based on something that I think is both obvious and startling and has all kinds of implications for teaching and literacy. I'm going to show you one possible pedagogical use of it, but I'm sure you'll find lots of others. This idea about language actually has an interesting history in linguistics, but for now and for our purposes, it might just be useful to point out that M.A.K. Halliday took an interpretation of this idea that became an important foundation of systemic functional linguistics. So, this is a pretty important idea. But don't worry, I'm not going to get too technical about it. Instead, I'm going to explain the basic idea of it here by using a very fun illustration that I've borrowed from a wonderful book by Suzanne Eggins. Her book is called An Introduction to Systemic Functional Linguistics. OK, so here is Eggins's example. Imagine that I'm talking to a friend about the exploits of my five-year-old progeny. I might say, when I got home from work, I could not believe what my progeny had done. Except, I probably wouldn't use the word progeny in a conversational context. Why not? True, it does denote the genealogical relationship between us, but I'm more likely to use a word like son, or boy, or child, or rugrat, or kid, or if it's a girl, girl. My choice of the word involves me in a meaning-making process in which I must choose which dimensions of contrast I wish to encode. Which dimensions of contrast I wish to encode. One of the choices I face is whether to specify the progeny's gender or not. Words like son or boy clearly specify gender while words like child or rugrat do not. Another choice I have is attitudinal content. Some of the words I use make my attitude towards the child apparent, while others do not. And these can be positive or negative attitudes. Language is a kind of a system then. It's a, it's a semiotic system. What this means is that whatever word I choose, progeny, offspring, infant, the meaning of each word comes in part from the fact that the word stands in opposition to the other words that are possible. My choice of brat is made against the background of the fact that I could have chosen child. My conversational audience recognises this and thereby interprets my choice as encoding negative attitude since I could have chosen to encode neutral attitude. All right, so much then for the semiotic systemic nature of language. And thank you, Suzanne Eggins, for the illustration of it. Illustration of what, though? Well, basically, that language is structured along two dimensions. There's the familiar horizontal dimension, 
or syntagmatic order. Letters in a word, words in a sentence, sentences in a paragraph, all occur in sequence. Look at the sequence here. A dog in the basket. The cat by a river. And one boy on his horse. OK, we're reading left to right and the sequence makes the sentence a sentence. The individual words make sense together because the words have a syntagmatic relationship with one another. Um, in the a dog basket doesn't make sense. But also notice that these same words have a different kind of relationship when we look at the vertical dimension, or more precisely, their paradigmatic relationship. This is the relationship where an individual sign might be replaced by another sign of the same kind or in the same set. A, the, one forms a particular set. Dog, cat, boy, another one. In, by, on, yet another one, and so on. Rules govern the order of signs in a syntagmatic relationship. That's the horizontal one. But choice governs the relationship of signs in a paradigmatic relationship, the vertical one. All right, so much for the theory. Let's have some fun with this. But first, let's hear a story. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. In the high and far off times, the elephant, oh best beloved, had no trunk. He had only a blackish, bulgy nose as big as a boot, and he could wriggle about, that he could wriggle about from side to side, but he couldn't pick up things with it. But there was one elephant, a new elephant, an elephant's child, who was full of satiable curiosity, and that means he asked ever so many questions. And he lived in Africa. And he filled all Africa with his satiable curiosities. He asked his tall aunt, the ostrich, why her tail feathers grew just so. And his tall aunt, the ostrich, spanked him with her hard, hard claw. He asked his tall uncle, the giraffe, what made his skin spotty. And his tall uncle, the giraffe, spanked him with his hard, hard hoof. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. He asked his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, why her eyes were red, and his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, spanked him with her broad, broad hoof. And he asked his hairy uncle, the baboon, why melons tasted just so, and his uncle, his hairy uncle, the baboon, spanked him with his hairy, hairy paw, and still he was full of satiable curiosity. He asked questions about everything that he saw or heard or felt or smelt or touched and all his uncles and his aunts spanked him. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. One fine morning, in the middle of the procession of the equinoxes, this satiable elephant's child asked a, f a new question a new fine question that he had never asked before. He asked, Why does the croco what does the crocodile have for dinner? Then everybody said, Hush! in a loud and dreadful tone. And they spanked him immediately and directly without stopping for a long time. By and by, when that was finished, he came upon Cola Cola Bird sitting in the middle of a wait-a-bit thorn bush, and he said, My father has spanked me, and my mother has spanked me. All my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my satiable curiosity, and still I want to know what the crocodile has for dinner. Then Cola Cola Bird said, with a mournful cry, Go to the banks of the great Grey, green, greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, and find out. That very next morning, 
when there was nothing left of the equinoxes, because the procession had proceeded according to precedent, this satiable elephant's child took a hundred pounds of bananas, the little short red kind, and a hundred pounds of sugar cane, the long purple kind, and seventeen melons, the greeny crackly kind, and said to all his dear families, Goodbye! I am going to the great grey green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, to find out what the crocodile has for dinner. And they all spanked him once more for luck, though he asked them most politely to stop. All right, well, I'm going to stop there. That, of course, was um, uh, the beginning of The Elephant's Child by Rudyard Kipling from a collection called Just So Stories. And here's my favourite line. Find the great grey, green, greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees. It's just so evocative. I don't need to put up any pictures on the screen. It just evokes a special, mysterious place. And listen to it. Find the great grey, green, greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees. It's musical as well. Wouldn't it be wonderful to write like this? Perhaps we can learn something about how it works by coming up with our own examples. Well, this is where we're going to apply our understanding of the syntagmatic and the paradigmatic. So let's just play with a segment of it, this bit. Great Grey Green Greasy Limpopo River. Let's just think syntagmatically for a moment. We've got a proper noun. Limpopo is a place preceding the main noun. And preceding these two are other words in this nominal group that collectively function as describers. Describers answer to the prompt of what like, as these answer to the prompt what. But to think paradigmatically now, let's go a little deeper with these functional elements. The word great is evaluative and is used here to connote importance. Grey-green is a factual describer, denoting colour and perhaps connoting a certain kind of personality. Greasy is another factual describer, also conno connoting personality. A greasy river is very evocative. Limpopo, we know, is a proper noun, but it also functions musically. It's alliterative. It's nice to say. Limpopo. And river, the main noun or head noun, is a thing denoting a, um, a land feature. So given all this, let's make some changes and think about choices in the spirit of the original text. For great, how about huge? For grey-green, angry orange. For greasy, since it needs to be a factual describer, but also suggests some personality to the thing, how about ancient? Osvovo for limpopo. And plain for forest. Of course, why stop here? Wondrous, sugar pink, pimpled gluntoto plain. And secret, shark silver parched, dust go go valley. So we can have some fun here and appreciate the work that Kipling's original achieved. We're ripping off Kipling. Yes, but we're also playing with language and learning something of its incredible resourcefulness. Find the huge, angry, orange, ancient Osvovo forest all set about with mushroom swamps. Or find the wondrous sugar pink pimpled Gluntoto plain all set about with sparkle grass. Or find the secret shark silver parched dust go go valley all set about with treacle rocks. All right, take your pick. Okay, well, I hope you've enjoyed this and we'll start experimenting with what you can do with this idea in the classroom. Thanks for watching.